Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. For this lecture, we are going to go through Chapter 9, the ISLM PC model. From Chapters 3 to 6, we looked at equilibrium in the goods and financial markets and saw how output is determined by demand in the short run. In Chapters 7 and 8, we looked at equilibrium in the labor market and derived how unemployment affects inflation. We now put the two parts together and use it to characterize the behavior of output, unemployment, and inflation, both in the short and the medium runs. When confronted with a macroeconomic question about a particular shock or a particular policy, the ISLM PC model, and here PC stands for Phillips curve, is the, tip, is the model I would typically start from. Therefore, Chapter 9 develops the ISLM PC model and looks at the dynamics of adjustment of output and inflation. Later, we will look at the dynamic effects of a fiscal consolidation and an increase in the price of oil. So, let's begin. So, some definitions to remember before we begin. Potential output, which is another name for natural level of output. You've probably seen this one before, output gap, which is the difference between actual output and potential output. Sometimes output gap is also expressed as a percentage. And lastly, anchored expectations. Your inflation expectations are said to be anchored if they do not respond to actual inflation in the economy. Previously, we have developed the following equation to describe the IS curve. In the short run, output is determined by demand. Demand is the sum of consumption, investment, and government spending. Consumption depends on disposable income, which is income minus taxes. Investment depends on output and the real borrowing rate or, or real interest rate which is the sum of the real policy rate R and the risk premium X. Government spending is thought to be exogenous. As interest rates decrease, investment increases, which leads to an increase in output overall. This is the downward sloping IS curve. Remember that the real policy rate R, which is chosen by the central bank, will be determined by nominal policy rate and the expected inflation rate. Previously, we also arrived at the following relationship for the Phillips curve. Using this Phillips curve, we want to be able to deduce certain links. So we are looking at the relationship between these two differences the difference between unemployment and the natural rate of unemployment and the inflation and the expected inflation. So, when unemployment differs from its natural rate, which is this, inflation will differ from its expected value. Similarly, when unemployment rate is equal to its natural rate, inflation is equal to its expected value. Again, when the unemployment rate is lower than the natural rate, inflation turns out to be higher than expected. If unemployment is higher than the natural rate, inflation turns out to be lower than expected. You should be able to deduce this re these relations from the Phillips curve. Given that the aggregate demand equation is in terms of output, rather than unemployment, our first step must be to rewrite the Phillips curve in terms of output rather than unemployment. It is easy, but it takes a few steps. So after derivation in Chapter 7, the unemployment rate was found to be equal to 1 minus output divided by the labor force. Replacing the unemployment equation into our Phillips curve gives us this equation. Notice that we also replaced expected inflation with inflation in the last period. This resulting equation explains the relationship between the inflation rate and the output gap. So, 
when output is above potential or the natural level and therefore your output gap is positive, inflation is increasing. Again, when output is below potential or the natural level and therefore your output gap is negative, your inflation is decreasing. The book drops time subscripts and just refers to pi t minus 1 as pi minus 1 in parentheses. You can use whichever notation that makes most sense to you. As we did in chapter 6, we can draw the IS curve between output y and the real policy rate r. This is shown in the top half of this figure. And as we know, the IS curve is downward sloping which means that the lower is the real policy rate, R, given by a flat LM curve, the higher is the equilibrium level of output. The mechanism behind this relation should be familiar by now. A lower policy rate, R, increases investment. The higher is the investment, the higher is the aggregate demand. Higher aggregate demand leads to higher output. The increase in output further increases consumption and investment, leading to a further increase in, in demand and output, and so on. In the last slide, using the modified Phillips curve, we saw that the relation between change in inflation and the output gap is positive. This positive relation between the output gap and the, and the change in inflation rate is drawn as the upward sloping Phillips curve in the bottom half of this figure. Output is measured on the horizontal axis and the change in inflation rate is measured on the vertical axis. When output is equal to its potential level or natural level at the red dot on the graph, or when the output gap is equal zero, the change in inflation rate is equals to zero, as shown by the second, second graph here. Thus, the Phillips curve crosses the horizontal axis at the point where output is equal to its potential or natural level. Remember that Yn is the natural level of output and the real interest rate that coincides with the natural level of output is the natural rate of interest, Rn. In the graph, R is less than Rn, and therefore, output is above its natural level on the green dot. This means that unemployment rate is less than the natural rate of unemployment rate, and therefore, there is upward pressure on wages, and in turn, upward pressure on prices. If the central bank were to keep R at this low rate, this would lead to greater and greater rates of inflation until the interest rate returns to Rn. Later we will see how that happens. But the takeaway from this graph is, a lower policy rate leads to higher output as shown by the top graph, and a higher output leads to larger change in inflation as shown by the bottom graph. We now have the two equations that we need to describe what happens in the short and in the medium run. So if the real interest rate being less than the natural rate of interest Rn creates such larger changes in inflation, the natural question is, why doesn't the central bank just always set R equals Rn? The thing is, that is not very easy. Because first, Yn can't be directly observed, it must be estimated or inferred based upon the behavior of inflation itself. Second, it takes time for the economy to adjust to policy changes. And if it takes time for Y to return to Yn, then the period where Y is greater than Yn will cause inflation to be much higher. Generally, the central bank has an inflation target, so they'll most likely want to raise R greater than Rn to bring inflation down to back to target. 
So, if expectations were anchored to the long run average or central bank's target, that is, if expected inflation would not respond to actual inflation and be fixed at pi bar, this would no longer be an issue. But because expectations are adaptive, that is, they do respond to actual inflation, this makes the central bank's job even harder. Now let's look at the dynamics of the ISLM PC model. Imagine the real interest rate in the economy is R, which is less than Rn. What happens over time if there is no change in the policy rate, nor in any of the variables which affect the position of the IS curve? Then the output remains above potential and inflation rate keeps rising. At some point, however, policy is likely to react to this increase in inflation. If we focus on the central bank, sooner or later the central bank will intervene and increase the policy rate so as to decrease output back to potential and then there is no longer pressure on inflation rate. The adjustment process and the medium run equilibrium are represented in the following graphs. Let the initial equilibrium be denoted as point A in both top and bottom graphs. You can think of the central bank as increasing the policy rate over time. So the economy moves along the ice curve from point A to point A prime. As a result, output decreases. Now return to the bottom graph. As output decreases, the economy moves down the PC curve from equilibrium point A to A prime. At point A prime, the policy rate is equals Rn, output is equals Yn, and by implication, inflation is constant or the change in inflation rate is equals zero. This is the medium run equilibrium. Our description of the adjustment has made the adjustment to the medium run equilibrium look relatively easy. If the output is too high, the central bank increases the policy rate until output is back up to potential. On the other hand, if output is too low, the central bank decreases the policy rate until the output is back up to potential. This is however too optimistic a picture and things can go wrong, and the reason is the combination of zero lower bound and deflation. Now look at this graph and suppose that we are at point A, where R is greater than Rn and Y is less than Yn, and the economy is in a recession. At current policy rate R, output is equals Y, which is far below Yn. The output gap is negative and inflation is decreasing. This initial equilibrium is represented by point A in both the top and bottom graphs. What the central bank should do in this case appears very straightforward. It should decrease the policy rate R until output has increased back to it its natural level. It should decrease the policy rate from R down to Rn. At Rn, output is equals Yn and the inflation is stable again. However, if the economy is sufficiently depressed, as shown in the graph, the real policy rate Rn needed to return output to its natural level is negative. The zero lower bound constraint may however make it impossible to achieve this negative real policy rate. For example, suppose that initial inflation is zero. Because of the zero lower bound, the lowest the central bank can decrease the nominal policy rate is 0%, which combined with the zero inflation that we supposed implies a real policy rate of 0%. The central bank can then only decrease the policy rate down to 0%, which is associated with the output level of Y prime denoted by the red dot on the graphs. This starts what economists call a deflationary spiral or, or a deflation trap. 
If inflation was equal to zero to start with, now it becomes negative. Zero inflation turns into deflation. This implies that even if the nominal rate remains equal to zero, the real policy rate increases, leading to even lower demand and lower output. Deflation and low output feed on each other. So, lower output leads to more deflation, and more deflation leads to an even higher real interest rate and lower output. As indicated by the arrows in the graphs, instead of converging to the medium run equilibrium, the economy moves away from it, with output steadily decreasing and deflation steadily becoming even larger. At this point, there is little the central bank can do and the economy moves from bad to worse. During the Great Depression, the US experienced a deflationary spiral. Now let's look at Great Depression data to understand what deflationary spirals look like. As you can see from the third column of the table, monetary policy decreased the nominal rate. Although this happened very slowly and did not go quite all the way down to zero. The nominal rate decreased from 5.3% in 1929 to 2.6% 2 in 1933. At the same time, the decline in output and increase in unemployment led to a sharp decrease in inflation, as you can see from the fourth column. The inflation rate, which was 0% in 1929, decreased to a low of minus 10.8% in 1932. The recent crisis gave rise to similar worries. With the policy rate down to zero in major advanced countries, the worry was that inflation would turn negative and start a similar deflationary spiral. This did not happen. Inflation decreased and in some countries turned to deflation. This limited the ability of the respective central banks to decrease the real policy rate and increase output but deflation remained limited, and the deflationary spiral did not happen. One reason that was so is because of the inflation expectations that remained largely anchored. That is, inflation expectations remained fixed and did not adapt to actual inflation. As a result, low output led to low inflation, and in some cases, mild deflation but not to a steadily larger deflation as had been the case during the Great Depression. Now we will look at the impact of fiscal consolidation on the short run and medium run equilibriums. Fiscal consolidation refers to the policies undertaken by governments to reduce their deficits. Suppose the economy is, in, is at potential where y is equals yn. This also means that r is equals rn. Remember that the ISLM model depicts the short run and the ISLM PC model depicts the long run. So the output is at potential, so the economy is at point e equilibrium point A in both the top and bottom graphs. Output, is, output y is equals yn, the policy rate is equals rn, and inflation rate is stable. Now assume that the government which was running a deficit decides to reduce its deficit by increasing taxes. This increase in taxes shifts the IS curve to the left from IS to IS prime. The new short run equilibrium is therefore given by point A prime in both the top and bottom graphs. At the given policy rate Rn, output decreases from Yn to Y prime and inflation starts decreasing. In other words, if output was at potential to start with, 
the fiscal consolidation, as desirable as it may be, leads to a recession. This is the short-run equilibrium we characterized in Chapter 5. Note that as income comes down and taxes increase, consumption decreases on both counts. As output decreases, so does investment. Therefore, in the short run, fiscal consolidation is rather unappealing because it decreases both consumption and investment. Let's, however, look at the dynamics in the medium run. As output is too low and inflation is decreasing, the central bank is likely to react and decrease the policy rate, which leads to a downward shift of the LM curve from LM to LM prime. As the, down, as the LM curve shifts downwards, this increases output. As output increases, the economy moves up the Phillips curve or the PC curve in the bottom graph until output is back to potential. Thus, the medium run equilibrium is given by point uh, A double prime in both the top and bottom graphs. Output is back at YN, the natural level, and inflation rate is stable again. The policy rate needed to maintain this output at potential or natural level is now lower than before, equal to Rn prime rather than Rn. Now let's look at the composition of output in this new equilibrium. As income is the same as it was before fiscal consolidation, but taxes are higher, consumption is lower, although not as low as it was before in the short run. As output is the same before, but interest rate is lower, investment is higher than before. In other words, the decrease in consumption is offset by an increase in investment and therefore demand or output is unchanged. This is in sharp contrast to what happened in the short run, and this makes fiscal consolidation look more attractive. Although fiscal consolidation may decrease investment in the short run, it increases investment in the medium run. Therefore, the takeaway from this is that fiscal, fiscal consolidation leads to a decrease in output in the short run. However, in the medium run, output returns to potential and the interest rate is lower. So far, we have only focused on the effects of demand-side shocks, like changes to consumer or business sentiment, as well as changes to fiscal and monetary policy. These changes in demand-side shocks only lead to shifts in IS and LM curves. However, supply-side shocks lead to shifts in the PC or the Phillips curve. Changes in the real price of oil is a supply-side shock. We could model this shock in one of the two ways. First, we could model the marginal cost of production as depending on the wage rate as well as the price of oil. Or, we could also simply model this as an increase in the markup M over the wage. The latter is much simpler to show than the former. In the 1970s, OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, acted as a monopoly and restricted the supply of oil to increase the price. In addition, wars in the Middle East also disrupted supply, leading to increasing prices. In addition to that, the oil price increase over the course of time was largely due to a sudden increase in demand for oil from emerging countries such as China, Brazil, India, etc.
The large fall in oil prices in 2008 was due to a drop in demand caused by the global financial crisis. And the most recent dip in 2014 is still up for debate, but most believe that it was caused by the shale oil boom in, to, in the United States. First, we are going to use the weight setting and price setting relations to see the impact of oil prices on unemployment. Remember that the weight setting relation is downward sloping and the price setting relation is represented by the horizontal line where real wage is equals 1 over 1 plus M. Also remember that the oil price increase is modeled as an increase in markup M. The initial equilibrium point is at point A and the initial natural level of unemployment rate is UN. An increase in the markup M leads to a downward shift of the price setting line from PS to PS prime. The higher the markup, the lower the real wage implied by the price setting 1 over 1 plus M. The equilibrium moves from A to A prime. The real wage is lower and the natural rate of unemployment is higher. Think of it in this way. Because firms have to pay for the oil, the wage they can pay is lower. Getting workers to accept the lower real wage requires an increase in unemployment. The increase in the natural rate of unemployment leads in turn to a decrease in the natural level of employment. If we assume that the relationship between employment and output is unchanged, that is, if each unit of output still requires one worker in addition to the oil input, then the decrease in the natural level of employment leads to an identical decrease in potential output. Putting things together, an increase in the price of oil leads to a decrease in potential output. Now let's see how that happens. Now we're at point A prime, which is the short run equilibrium. At this point, inflation rate is increasing as shown by the bottom graph. If the central bank increases the policy rate to stabilize inflation, then the LM curve shifts upwards from LM to LM prime. And the economy moves to its new medium run equilibrium at point A double prime. At this point, output is lower and change in inflation rate is zero. But the inflation rate itself is higher than before. This leads to stagflation in the economy which is lower output, higher unemployment, and higher inflation. There are a few takeaways from this chapter. First, shocks or changes in policy typically have different effects in the short run and in the medium run. And the effect of various policies depends on how fast the economy adjusts to these shocks. We are done with the lecture for now. Let me know if you have questions. Bye-bye.